want to say that God don't leave himself without a witness. And when the praise team first came up when service began, God spoke to me in the spirit and said, lay hands on your pastor. And as Margaret was giving me altar call prayer, she just was speaking everything that God has spoke to me. And out of obedience, I want you all to point towards Reverend Mill as I lay hands on her because I want to be obedient to the spirit because the devil is a liar. This means war. I plead, I plead the blood of Jesus. Gracious God, our Father, we thank you. We glorify you, we magnify you, oh God, because your word said we have not because we ask not. Oh God, you said lay hands, hallelujah, and heal, oh God. So out of obedience, oh God, we lay hands on our pastor right now, oh God. Asking you to touch her right now from the crown of her head to the soles of her feet, oh God, hallelujah. This thing that have tried to overtake her, hallelujah. We rebuke it right now in the name of Jesus. We cast it out and we declare that it shall flee in the name of Jesus. We plead the blood right now, oh God, hallelujah. And God, we ask for immediate healing right now in the name of Jesus. Touch her from the crown of her head to the sole of her feet. Restore joy, hallelujah. Restore healing, hallelujah. Restore her vision, hallelujah. That she may go forth and do what you have called her to do. And we'll continue to give your name the praise, the honor, and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Now I want you to do something for me if you will. If you would just stand up on your feet just for a moment, just for a couple of seconds. And what I want you to do is to give God praise like this might be the last time. So about three weeks ago in Sunday school, I was sitting on that back pew back there. And if you all 
don't, you, you're missing a lot when you don't come to Sunday school because we be having an awesome time. And Reverend, uh, Lord, you was all up in my message this morning when we was talking. But about three weeks ago, I was sitting on that back pew in, in Sunday school and I had been asking God, God, what am I going to speak about? And in the midst of, I think, uh, I'm to, I think it was Juanita that was, you know, holding the class that Sunday. And God just spoke to me clearly. He said, talk about me as the promise keeper. I said, okay, God, I'll speak about the promise keeper. Coming out of Genesis, the third chapter, verses 8 through 15, I'm not going to read it because it's already been read. But we know the story is the story of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden and the disobedience and the being rebuked out of the garden forever. It was not supposed to be, but because of their disobedience, God removed them from the Garden of Eden, never to return. And he told Satan, the serpent, you're going to crawl on your belly for the rest of your life and I will redeem my people. Church, today I would like to talk about God as the promise keeper. It is my hope that something will be said that will encourage you to trust in God and not allow anything or anyone to make you doubt God. Let me start off by saying that if you're under the notion that accepting Jesus as Lord and Savior of your life is it, and life is going to be a cakewalk, easy peasy if you will, well I'm here to tell you that's not how this thing works. Not to be frightened though, I just want you to know that you have made the best decision that you can ever make in your life when you accept God's call to be a part of his family. But in this journey that we are on, there are going to be some storms along the way. Some tests and trials, some obstacles yes. that will try to get you off your game. Well, the Bible says that God reigns on the just and the unjust. Yes. And just in case you were thinking bad things are not going to happen to you because you're on God's team, well, bad things happen to us. I'm a living witness, and I'm sure I'm not by myself. You see, in this journey, we're going to experience all kinds of things. But like I said, if we trust God, know God's word, we can go back to God. The Bible says there are, well, I've been, as I was doing my studying and researching, I discovered that there's over 5,400 promises in the Bible. 5,400 promises. These are promises that God said, if you stand on it, I promise you I'll bring it to pass. Now, the only way for us to know those promises is if we know the word. Yes. We got to know the word of God. That's our tool. Yes. That's what we stand on as Christians. If we're trying to be Christian without God's word, we already lost. All right. All right. Amen. Okay. Many of us have gone through things that were not pleasant. And we begin to question God and say, why me, Lord? Why did I have to go through this? Why have you taken my loved one away? Why have you taken my job, my means of provision? Well, I cannot stand up here and say that I can tell you why God chooses to allow the bad things to happen to us to happen. But I am a firm believer in God's word. And when I find myself in situations, I look to God's word for answers, for assurance, for strength. And in the book of Romans 8 and 28, it says, and we know that all things work together for the good to them that love God and are called according to his purpose. Yeah. Even though it don't feel good, if you hold on long enough, yes. it's going to work out for your good. Yes. I've, I've, I've seen it too many times in my own life, and I'm sure I got witnesses with me yeah. that have seen that, you know, when our back's against the wall, yes, sir. God makes a way. Yeah. God come and we come shining through like the sun when it breaks through the clouds. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. The promises of God tells me, although this, this is happening to me, if I put my trust in God, the end result will work in my favor. I will come out smelling like roses. You see, church, we are living in a time where people are not trusting in God. 
That's why there's a decline in our membership in churches. People are trusting in their own abilities yes, sir. To, make it, to make it happen by any means necessary. But the Bible said, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. And acknowledge him in all that way that he will direct your path. You see, when the voting season come around, election season come around, we got politicians running around telling us they going to do this for us. They going to do that for us. They promise they going to do this for us. But the minute they get in the office, they turn the other cheek. They, they decline on what they said they was going to do. Even in marriage, you know, I, this, this startled me when I found out that over 65% of marriages, Christian marriages, end in divorce. 65% and I was like, wow. <laughs> we stand up here on our, 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 our wedding day, looking all good, happy, feeling good, yeah. making all these promises to death do us part, for richer, for poor, in sickness and health. Uh -huh. But the minute storms and trials come, yeah. a lot of people decide they want to turn their back yeah, that's right. and forget the promise that they made in the beginning. God is a promise keeper. And if we trust in him, he will see us through it. That is a promise of God, and he is a promise keeper. If you will allow me to take you on a journey through the Bible, I would like to lift up a few scripture verses to show that God is a promise keeper. First, we have Noah. In Noah's day, in time, people were living foul. I mean foul. They were doing all manner of things. If you read in the book of Genesis, you'll find out that I'm telling the truth. And this displeased God. And sad to say, I see the world that we live in as in these times of Noah. Living foul. Displeasing God. And we all know from history that when God is displeased, God is going to do something about that displeasure. Yeah. Yeah. And so God told Noah, he spoke to Noah and said, Noah, I want you to build an ark. You know the story. And when the ark is finished, I want you and your family to go into the ark with two animals, a female and a male, from each breed. And Noah did what God said. And in the midst of building this ark, Noah was preaching and telling people, it's going to rain. Water is going to fall from the sky. Well, people didn't believe him because this had never happened on the earth before. And so, you know, you can kind of understand, okay, this man talking about something that ain't never happened. You know, I'm, I'm not giving weight to that. But Noah kept preaching it. Day in and day out, he preached. God said it's going to rain. His water is going to fall from the sky. And so when water began to fall from the sky, people just... Oh, okay, it's just happening a little bit. You know, we get a little rain here. But it kept falling. And it kept falling. And before you know it, people started running to the ark. But the ark had already been sealed. When God makes a promise, God is going to keep his promise. And God said, if you're not in the ark when the door is closed, you're not getting in the ark. And we know the end of the story. Noah and his family were saved. And they had to replenish the earth. The next person I want to talk about is Moses. And you know the story of Moses. Moses grew up in Egyptian, even though he was a Hebrew. You know the story, if you look at the Ten Commandments every Easter, his mom put him in a basket and pushed him down the Nile River, and Pharaoh's daughter found him. And she raised Moses as an Egyptian. He was a prince. But that was in God's plan. God being a promise keeper. Because Israel was enslaved to the Egyptians for over 400 years. But God promised that he was going to bring them out. And you know the story. God brought them out. Even though it took Pharaoh getting beat upside the head I don't know how many times. But he let the people go. And then in the midst of that crossing the Red Sea on dry land what a mighty God we serve. Yes. God promised them when they got their backs up against the wall 
that you will never see these Egyptians again. And the people had a hard time believing that because there wasn't nowhere to go. They were, they backs were up against the, the Red Sea and Pharaoh was coming from this side. So there was nowhere to go. And God spoke to Moses and said, use that thing that you got in your hand, that, that staff. And you know the story. And I know sometimes we look at these stories in the Bible and say, yeah, okay, I understand. You know, that's what the Bible says. But did that really happen? Well, I'm a firm believer that it happened. You see, because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If we don't have no faith, we'll probably never see anything, any miracles. Just a little bit of faith. God said, if you have a mustard seed of faith, you can say to the mountain, be thou removed and cast into the sea, and it shall be. About three weeks ago, I'm out delivering mail, and it, it rained, it seemed like, for like five days in a row, it seemed like. And we just recently experienced that again. But I remember sitting in my truck trying to wait the rain out, and I got so frustrated, I, I went on Facebook and I said, I rebuke this rain in the name of Jesus, and I command this rain to stop so I can finish delivering this mail because I do not want to get wet anymore. <laughs> I kid you not, God stopped that rain for about an hour and a half. I did not get one drop of rain on me. I praise God for that because we have more power than we realize. Hallelujah. If we speak the word, the word will work for us if we speak it. Hallelujah. And then here we go with Abraham and Sarah. God changed their name from Ab Abram and Sarah. To Abraham and Sarah and he promised them Abraham that he was going to give him a child yes. and make from that child a great nation and the weird thing about it as you know the story Abraham then was in their 90s yeah I know <laughs> in their 90s and God promising him that he going to have a child you know, but back in those days, 90 was like 20. 90 was the 20 for these days. <laughs> because they didn't have as much sin and pollution going on in the world back then. So you wasn't aging like we age now. But in the midst of that, they laughed. Sarah laughed and said, well, God, what you going to do with this? I'm 90 years old. <laughs> we, we ain't going to be doing none of this. And Abraham said, well, God said it. We got to trust it. But Sarah didn't believe. And she said, well, maybe he was telling you to go to your, my handmaid, Haggai, you know, a young tenderoni. Yeah. You know, and, and you can go and, you know, mate with her. See, back in them days, you, you could do that. You know, it was all right to do that. If you, you got a hall pass, so to speak. <laughs> but it's just like us today. We're no different. We, we, God tells us something. We try to help God out. We try to get in the midst of it. And, you know, when all we got to do, if God said it, you can believe, you can take that to the bank and deposit it because it's going to happen. Amen. But Sarah tried to help God just like we try to do sometimes. And she sent, you know, Abraham to Hagar, his, her handmaid, and he ended up having a baby with her. And then Sarah got jealous behind that. Because Hagar was flaunting that thing, you know, I got a child by your husband, but you don't have none. When God promised Sarah that she would have one. And so eventually Sarah had Isaac. And as they, the kids were growing up, Sarah began to be jealous. And so when somebody had to go, because no way two queens gonna live in the house, you know, at the same time. Just ain't gonna happen. Cat fight. Can you say cat fight? <laughs> so you know the story. God kept his promise. And out of Abraham came two great nations. And they still warn today with each other. Brothers are warn with each other to this day. But God is a promise keeper. If God said he's going to do it, you can bank on it. Wow. And then... I want to talk about Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now God promised them in captivity 
that he would keep them. By this time, Daniel and the Israelites had been captured by Nebuchadnezzar. Yes. But it wasn't because Nebuchadnezzar was after them, it's because God was punishing them because of their disobedience. When are we going to get it right with God? Knowing that when we disobey him, he's got to, you know, chastise us. But the Bible says he's chasing those whom he loves. Yeah. So when he do rebuke you, when he do chasing you, it's out of love. So you don't have to get mad at God and turn your back on him and say, I don't want no more parts of this. If God is punishing you or, or chastising you, so to speak, it's because he loves you and he's trying to keep you on that straight and narrow path. So I praise God for that. But in the midst of Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and what was weird about that whole situation is that King Nebuchadnezzar, who was the king of Babylon, who the Israelites were in captivity with, he loved Daniel. He loved Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He loved them so much that he gave them rulership over his providence, over certain providence in his kingdom. But because of the haters, and we are all gathered because of the haters the Babylonians who were part of the king's court didn't like the fact that Daniel and these Israelite boys were ruling over them they decided to come up with a decree that you know everybody must bow to the Babylonian gods and as we know the story Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego told them Look here, regardless of what you decide you want to do to us, there's no way we're going to bow down to you. Our God is able to deliver us. And even if he don't, we'll go to our grave believing that. And that's exactly what they did. And the king decided, well, we're going to throw him in the fiery furnace. And he had the furnace turned up seven times higher. And he threw the Hebrew boys in the furnace. And you know the story. Amen. The king looks in the furnace and he said, didn't we put three people in there? He said, but I see four. And the fourth one looked like the son of God. God promised he'll never leave you nor forsake you. He'll be with you always, even until the ends of the earth. If God said it, you can believe it. You can take that to the bank and deposit it. And then Daniel, who had interpreted dreams for the king and told him what was to come to pass of these dreams, the king loved Daniel. I mean, he loved Daniel. But because Daniel wouldn't bow down, because Daniel wouldn't give in, because Daniel wouldn't do what the Babylonians want him to do, and they had made that decree, Daniel got thrown in the lion's den. And if you know, and I love to watch the Wild Kingdom channel, my wife hates it. But I love to see those animals. Oh man, just something about nature. And you know that when a lion is hungry, yeah. So it don't matter what he eats, the lion gonna eat. And they threw Daniel in the lion's den. Do you not know that God shut the lion's mouth up? And what's so amazing is that the next day when the king went to the den hoping and praying, knowing that Daniel was dead, but he, in his heart he was hoping that Daniel was alive. Mm -hmm. And when they opened the thing, Daniel laying on top of the lion sleep. <laughs> laying on top of the lion sleep. Amen. I'm trying to get you all to picture this thing. God has got our best interest yes. ever. Yes. Yes. He said, I know the plans I have for you. Yes. It's to prosper you, to bring you to an expected end. God wants the best for us. The promise keeper. Hallelujah. I'm almost done here. I told you I wasn't going to keep you long. God promises us that he will never leave us nor forsake us. He is a promise keeper. From the stories told to me by my grandmother who was born in 1908 and will make a Kansas. She said her parents were born into slavery for uh, the Emancipation Proclamation in 19, 1863 by President Lincoln. So her parents grew up as slaves. And even in her day and time, 1908, 
we know that African Americans were still experiencing slavery. Yeah, that's right. But she told me that there was always this promise that was given to our ancestors that God was going to deliver. Yeah. Amen. And we know the story. We know the story. We've been delivered. Yeah, yeah we're going through some things. We're still going through some things. But in this life, we're going to always be going through some things. Yeah. But look at God. We're living better than we've ever lived before. Yes. Living in mansions. Yes. Living in houses that we didn't build. Yes. Driving some of the best cars in the world. Yes. Say it. Won't he will? Yes. Won't he will? Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. But don't get it twisted. Because we didn't do this thing on our own. Yes. It was because of the ancestors who yes. couldn't read and write. Praying for us. Asking God to bring deliverance amongst us. Hallelujah. To God be the glory. Hallelujah. God is an awesome God. Amen. I'm talking about the promise keeper. And I'm almost finished, but I would like to lift up just a few more verses to show you the power of promises of God. 1 John 1 and 9, God promises forgiveness and a new heart. Yes, the scripture says, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Did you hear me? Yes. If we confess our sins, yes. God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We the word of God says, come boldly to the throne of grace that ye may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. God got this whole thing covered if we just trust that his word will do what his word said he would do. He said, for one jot or tittle will change. My word will do what it has, has said that it would do. Malachi 3.10, God's promise about money, finances, prosperity, and employment. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, uh -huh. that there may be meat in my house, and prove me now herewith, said the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it, and I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, said the Lord of hosts. God. God promised that. Yes. Yes. If we trust in him and give him our tithes and our offerings, he promised that he'll see us through. He'll make provisions for us. He'll supply our every need. Yeah. Ain't he doing it? Yes, I know you woke up this morning and looked in your covers and said, man, what am I going to eat today? Or maybe you said, well, I don't have to make that decision because I know Marvin and them is going to do something marvelous in the back for hospital, hospitality. Yeah. Woo! Check out God. God promised to supply every need, Philippians 4.19. Yes. But my God shall supply all your needs yes. according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. This whole world belongs to God. He yes. created, he can do what he wants with it. Yes. And he can make provision where he wants to make provision. So trust that he'll do that. Amen. Isaiah 26 and 3, God promises about peace. Thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. Because he trusted in thee. Yes. He promised to keep our minds in perfect peace when we trust in him. When we keep it on him. Trusting in God. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. God promised help in overcoming temptation. No test has overtaken you that is not common to everyone. That's right. God will also faith. provide a way out so that you may be able to endure it. When those type trust, tests and trials come, you can trust that God is going to make a way for you to escape. You can trust that God is going to be in the midst of it, making sure that you're all right if you're trusting in him. You see, this thing works two ways. God expects something from us when we expect something from him. And I'm telling you, I expect God to do a whole lot of stuff. Right. I'm still working on that, uh, you know, giving him what he wants. I'm still working on that part. But uh, I trust his word. I 
I trust God's word yes. to the Amen. fullest. Amen. To the fullest. It has sustained me over these last 20 years. Like I said before, you know, I didn't grow up in a church. I didn't grow up knowing God like I know him now. You know, it wasn't until about 30 years old when I really came to knowing who God was. I always believed that there was a God, but I didn't know who God was. But about the age of 30, I started reading the Bible for myself and started going to church for myself and just started getting inspired, trusting in God. Through my experiences of trusting in his word, I have seen God work Praise miracles God. in my life. Hallelujah. Yes, and I thank him for it. Praise God. Yes. This brings me to my first point and my only point. <laughs> God is a promise keeper. God is a promise keeper. As you know from the scripture, God promised that because the man and the woman had disobeyed him, that they would have to be punished. And he, he told the woman, he said, you're going to travail in pregnancy. And I'm sure many of you can testify that have had children that it wasn't easy. But you made it through. Thank God for that. Because some didn't make it. In childbirth, some have died. And that's the consequences of Eve disobeying God in the Garden of Eden. And he promised the man that you would till the ground. You would have to work for your labor. You would have to labor for your provision. And we have, we have truly been laboring for our provision. But then I want you to hear this. He promised the serpent that the woman, because of the birth of the child, is going to bruise your head with his feet and you're going to bruise his heel and I'm here to tell you that God kept his promise because through 42 generations you read in the book of Matthew hallelujah about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and God said I'm going to keep my promise because there was nobody to do it God decided that he was going to do it himself. And God took a part of himself and he wrapped it up in flesh. Hallelujah. And if you know the word of God, you know that the Bible said in the beginning was the word and the word was God and the word was with God. And if you read on down in the first chapter of John, it says the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory as the only begotten of the Father full of grace and truth. God is a promise keeper and God kept his promise. Hallelujah. He decided to come down from his throne. Hallelujah. And wrap himself up in flesh. Hallelujah. And walk on this earth for 33 years. Hallelujah. Declaring the kingdom of God is at hand. Hallelujah. Oh my God did it. Hallelujah. He kept his promise. Hallelujah. And he didn't stay there. Hallelujah. You know the story. Hallelujah. Of how he was hung on the cross. Hallelujah. And he began to speak to the two thieves. Hallelujah. And the one thief said, if you're the son of God, remember me when you get to your kingdom. And he kept this promise. Hallelujah. For he told them this day. Hallelujah. You will be with me in paradise. Hallelujah. But he didn't stay there. Hallelujah. He decided to die. Hallelujah. For yours and my sin. Hallelujah. And he went down to the grave. Hallelujah. And he took the keys from the grave. Hallelujah. And he said, oh grave, where is thy victory? Hallelujah. Oh death, where is thy sting? Hallelujah. But he didn't stay there. Hallelujah. You know the story. Hallelujah. He rose on the third day. Hallelujah. Declaring all power in his hands. Hallelujah. And I can tell you right now. Hallelujah. He's sitting at the right hand of God. Making intercessory for us. We can trust God. We can believe God. If God said it, I believe it. And that's enough for me. Hallelujah. 